folks, now we have the last lecture of the day. We have with us Emily Denton from uh, Google's Research and Machine Intelligence Group. So Emily works on developing tools and techniques to promote fair, inclusive, and ethical AI. Um, she's actually very, very generous and agreed to give two talks at this, uh, at this school. So we have her today talking about um, this stuff. And then is it tomorrow you're tomorrow. talking about uh, generative, models. generative models? Awesome. Um, so um, just a little bit more about Emily. So she's particularly interested in detecting and mitigating harmful bias in computer vision systems. Uh, so when you're doing machine learning for people and social kind of things, this kind of stuff is very important. But you can always think about how these things have anal um, analogs in the kind of science work we want to do. We want models that are robust against issues with our, our data and stuff like this. Um, so Emily got her PhD from the Courant Institute in, uh, at NYU in machine learning. And um, there her research focused on unsupervised learning, generative modeling, stuff like that. So um, thank you, Emily. We can get started. All right, can you all hear me? Yeah, cool. Um, awesome, yeah, so very excited to speak with you today. Um, so this talk, this talk is gonna cover um, a subset of the sort of broader ethical considerations that are involved when building uh, machine learning systems. This, how's that? Better? Yeah, okay. Um, so, so yeah, machine learning fairness is, it's a huge complex emerging uh, space sort of at the intersection of business and law and ethics and data science and engineering and social justice. Um, and so I'm going to kind of consider this like a light primer and a whole bunch of different things. And hopefully you can kind of like dig into some of the references and different things if it interests you. So cool. So when machine learning is typically taught, um, you know, we tend to focus on a very narrow uh, range of uh, uh, metrics. Um, and the goal is typically, you know, pick a metric, optimize for it. Um, you know, in that case, model C is what we should pick here. Uh, in this talk, we're going to be thinking about other issues that um, might come into play when we're thinking about uh, developing models that are going to be deployed in the world. So um, I'm just going to read this quote from The Guardian. This is from a couple of years ago. Um, so although neural networks uh, might be said to write their own programs, they do so towards goals set by humans using data collected for human purposes. If the data is skewed, even by accident, the computers will amplify injustice. So at a high level, algorithmic unfairness refers to the myriad of ways in which harmful societal biases can get embedded in algorithms uh, and lead to unjust or prejudicial treatment uh, of people based on all sorts of different sensitive characteristics like race or gender or sexual orientation or disability status and so on and so forth. Um, and so without sort of really careful consideration of the societal context within which these systems are being built, um, patterns of structural inequity that are reflected in data sets can easily become embedded in these models. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple examples of like what I mean when I say this, but before that I want to just like make a real clarification point. Um, you know, there's a distinction between the sort of uh, uh, phrase bias as used in statistics and the type of bias that I'm referring to here, right? Uh, machine learning is sort of at the core about discrimination and bias. Um, Throughout this talk, I'm going to be using bias to refer to sort of unjustified um, discrimination, not the kind of you know core machine learning use of the term. So, okay, so here's a really uh, good example. So machine learning models are increasingly being utilized within the U.S. Uh, carceral system to inform decision making in the context of bail and parole and sentencing. Uh, in 2016, ProPublica released a study of the Compass risk assessment algorithm. This was a proprietary software developed by a company North Point. Um, and this algorithm used information about our defendant's sort of socioeconomic status and family background, neighborhood crime, and other sorts of things to reach a supposed prediction of their um, uh, individual risk. Um, and so ProPublica did a sort of audit of this algorithm, and they found that the tool cor correctly predicted recidivism about 61% of the time. Um, but there was a clearly racialized pattern in terms of the errors that were made. Um, so the tool was twice as likely to falsely flag a black defendant as a future criminal um, and wrongly labeling this way uh, about twice as much as their um, sort of comparable like white defendants. Uh, and in contrast, white defendants were mislabeled, um, but in the inverse way. 
So, you know, these error patterns that are observed, um, they're not super surprising, um, just given that the variables that are used to train the system are sort of inherently structured by um, patterns of, of racial oppression in the society in which we're living. Um, you know, so another example here, this is the work of a PhD student at MIT Media Lab, um, Joy Bluemweeney. So she's been looking at um, how different facial analysis systems um, sort of differentially recognize people with different um, skin tones. Um, and so the kind of failure of AI systems to account for and recognize people of all different ethnicities and genders uh, and socioeconomic status and all of these things, like this has a serious potential to exacerbate existing sort of inequality in our society. Um, again, machine translation, this is another example where um, sort of social biases get embedded into the system. And in this example here, we see that um, sort of stereotypically male words get translated with a male pronoun, um, whereas stereotypically female words get defaulted to female pronouns. Um, this is something that Google actually fixed um, earlier this year, so that's kind of good. Um, okay, so um, there's lots of different ways of characterizing um, the different types of harm that can result from ML systems. Um, I won't go into too much depth here because there's so many different types of framings, but this is one um, that I think is nice and it's kind of, you know, comes up repeatedly. And this is a distinction between um, allocative harm and representational harm. Uh, and so allocative harm has to do with the allocation of sort of resources or opportunities. Um, sort of, you know, material harm, basically. If you have a hiring algorithm that is sort of disproportionately uh, recommending different groups of people to be hired, this would, um, you know, fall into this, this category. And then representational harm occurs when technology um, like reinforces stereotypes or diminishes specific groups. And so thinking about this harm is really important because, um, you know, it highlights the fact that machine learning plays a really important role in representations of identity in our society. Um, and then another thing I think is often underlooked in the ML fairness world is the um, sort of tendency um, for Silicon Valley generally to just propose technical fixes to social problems, um, often without fully understanding the social problem and the kind of structural conditions underlying it. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, we're all, most of us, I think, come from science and engineering backgrounds, and so we're taught to, like, abstract away the problem and really, you know, get to the meat of it and try and come up with a nice, simple solution. And often, um, you know, this can be part of a solution, but this isn't the whole thing, and so I think it's really important to, um, you know, understand um, when we're falling into these kinds of patterns. Um, and this is often even worse when data-driven prediction systems are, like, touted as more objective and more neutral um, because they are based on data. Um, so um, this is a nice quote from Ruha Benjamin, who has a great book. So she says, the narrow investment in technical innovation necessarily displaces a broader set of social interests. Um, this is a form of exclusion and subordination built into the various ways in which priorities are established and solutions are defined in the tech industry. Um, and then similarly, the sort of allure of objectivities is really dangerous. Um, and so here she says that when bias is routed through uh, techno science encoded as scientific and objective, then it becomes even more difficult to challenge and hold individuals and institutions accountable. So this is why it's like really, really important from the beginning of the design process to understand, you know, what are the problems we're trying to fix? Is there a technical solution? Is that the entire solution? You know, are you, you know, kind of engaging with the relevant stakeholders and so on and so forth? So just really quick thing. So why is this important to all of you? Because um, you're all coming from a um, different sort of science background. And a lot of the stuff that we're going to go through today, um, a lot of the harms come from models being built on social data and being deployed in a social setting. Um, and I know that, you know, immediately you might think this isn't super applicable to your work. So I want to kind of just like motivate you to like pay attention and like, why should you care? Um, besides it being interesting and as people, you should care. Um, so... Cool. So first, um, this is a little cliche, but like with great power comes great responsibility. You're learning, um, you know, a lot of really, really powerful tools this week. Um, and, you know, you might initially think you're going to leverage these tools in your, you know, very sort of narrow range um, of discipline. Um, but machine learning is increasingly touching sort of every aspect of our lives. And so um, I think it's really important that as you become aware of these skills, you understand, you know, how are these systems being deployed? Um, and, and also just kind of understanding that this is, you know, it's a, it's a pretty unregulated area. There's a lot of different ways in which machine learning models are being used. Um, and just kind of be conscious of the broader ethical considerations, um, even if you don't think they immediately apply to your work right now. Um, but also they might. Um, so secondly, um, I'd like to emphasize that like no science or technology is ever developed in a vacuum. Um, technologies are often depicted as being neutral, you know, and kind of developed outside of the political and social contexts. 
Um, but this is, um, I think, and a lot of scholars have argued, just kind of false. Um, and you know, most science and technology, you know, inadvertently or explicitly embodies different sort of social relations. Um, so there's a lot of classic examples of this, which um, I'll skim through for the sake of time. But you know, we've seen that the ways in which we design the material world um, has the potential to reflect and reinforce social hierarchies, or also subvert them. Um, and you know, similarly, this is an example of like uh, physics. So, you know, people might say, ah, oh, physics is physics, it's neutral, it's science. Um, but the uh, sort of modern photography uh, is an example that is very not value neutral. Um, so modern photography was developed with a very white norm coded into camera sensors. Um, and, you know, this is, this is um, now, you know, affects a lot of different sensors that are deployed in the world. Uh, and it took a very long time for, you know, the photography in, uh, industry to even take notice of this. So this is another great paper I'll direct you to read um, by Ben Green. Basic argument for four is that data scientists just need to recognize themselves as, as political actors um, engaged in basically the normative construction of different aspects of society. So, okay. Um, and then finally, um, this is important for you because a lot of the best practices that we'll see um, for sort of ethics informed design and development are also just good practices generally. Um, you know, a lot of them things deal with sort of accountability and transparency and interpretability. Um, and that's sort of important for everybody in machine learning. Cool. So, a uh, typical ML model um, paradigm is kind of broken down into sort of data collection and then model choices. Um, and a common way of thinking about this that a lot of people hold, I think, is the data, you know, just kind of like reflects the world. And then if we fit an algorithm, the better we fit it, the better our model is going to be. Um, and um, I'm also going to be focusing a little bit on the kind of like downstream use cases of all of this. Um, so starting with data. Um, a lot of people think that data just reflects the world. As I've said, it's not, data's never neutral. It's always some kind of representation of reality filtered through you know, different sort of human processes. Um, so um, I'm gonna go through just a couple different types of biases that might get into your data set. Uh, again, a lot of the harms that are gonna result from these are um, sort of within the social setting, um, but understanding data set bias is relevant sort of everywhere that we are using data. So sampling bias, obviously, you know, this occurs when a data set is not representative of the underlying population of interest. Um, you know, we see a lot of common image data sets in machine learning exhibiting different sort of gender and racial and geographic biases. You might also have biases based on the types of instruments you're using to collect your data sets, um, you know, times of day and conditions and all of these types of things. It's really important to be um, cognizant of all of this when you're developing your data sets. Um, these are just a couple examples of like common face data sets that people use. Um, there's a significant sort of uh, skin tone skew and also gender skew. Uh, the open images data set and ImageNet, these are very common image data sets. They have a very significant geographical skew. Um, this is just another visualization that kind of highlights that about 60% of the data comes from the six most represented countries uh, in North America and Europe. Um, also, unequal distribution of demographics within uh, each class. This is also an important thing. So this data set found um, sort of significant gender biases with different activities that were present in the data set. Um, so human reporting bias, this is another thing. Um, this basically means that the frequency with which people sort of write about actions and outcomes um, doesn't reflect sort of real world um, statistics. Um, so this is a nice example of like word learning from text. You know, if you just like trained a model on text, you would think that people were murdered way more than they exhaled. Um, but obviously this is not true. Um, so again, like the things that our data are telling us are not necessarily representative of what is actually happening in the world. Um, I like this example. Um, so, you know, if you ask people what they see here, they'll typically say like bananas or a bundle of bananas. Um, and um, if you show people this image, now they'll say green bananas. Um, and so this is because people tend to sort of mention the things um, that are uh, not prototypical. So yellow is like very prototypical banana, so it won't be mentioned. Green is like, oh, this is novel and interesting and is salient to this particular image, and so I'll mention it. Um, so this can also carry over into um, sort of social stereotypes, right? Somebody might caption the image of the top doctor and then the one at the bottom female doctor because, you know, female is like an atypical, you know, sort of stereotype type in this field. Um, furthermore, so stereotypes are these sort of internalized associations um, that, uh, you know, occur through like natural processes of learning and categorization. Um, and implicit biases are, are super pervasive. They operate largely unconsciously. 
um, and they can automatically influence the ways in which people sort of see the world. Um, and these are really, really important when we're having, you know, people annotate our data sets, right? Um, and I think this is something that's like really, really overlooked in machine learning is, um, you know, what types of cultural biases are getting into your data sets just purely through the annotation process. Um, right, so again, here, this might look like captioning one of these images doctor and one of these images nurse. Um, racial stereotypes are also really important. Um, I mean, again, it's really important to like tie these back to the kind of social setting in which these systems might be deployed. Um, cool, so ultimately data is not a neutral reflection of reality. Um, just really important to remember throughout. So how does this type of bias affect machine learning models that are ultimately trained on this data? Um, so I touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, a super common and now pretty well documented um, result of unrepresentative training data is models that exhibit differential performance um, across different groups. Um, so this is kind of looking at different facial analysis systems that um, are unable to detect darker skinned faces. Um, this is some follow-up work that was looking at um, sort of, you know, a, a broader range of facial analysis systems, similar sort of patterns were found. Um, this is more follow-up work looking at state-of-the-art pedestrian detection systems, again, finding disparities between lighter and darker skinned pedestrians. Um, in all these cases, like, the thing to remember is that this means that, like, not only were these models not trained on representative data, but they, like, went through the entire pipeline of, like, deployment without anybody ever doing this type of testing. Um, so, again, like, when you're building models, just really be thinking about, like, you know, how representative your data set is. If you think it might not be representative, do some adversarial testing, find some new data, try and understand these patterns. Um, and, again, this has happened before. Um, you know, we've kind of seen throughout history, um, you know, light-skinned male bodies being taken kind of consistently as the default time and time again. Um, we've seen this with like camera sensors, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we've seen this with crash test dummies. Uh, we see it in like medical research. Um, so the types of things that we're encountering here, you know, they're not new. Um, cool, so again, disparities in accuracy. This is looking at, um, you know, a model that was trained on very US-centric uh, data. Uh, and unable to kind of recognize a, a photo of a wedding outside of that very specific cultural mold. Um, this is an example of a model that comes out of Google. So this is a toxicity classifier. So it takes in like a phrase of text um, and then predicts whether or not um, the text is toxic. And this is deployed all over the place to help with different sort of content moderation problems. Um, but this team, when they first built it, they realized that the model had incorrectly learned to associate names of frequently targeted identities with toxicity. Um, and so these examples here, like none of these comments are toxic, but the model predicted otherwise. Um, just because um, the sources where the model was trained on, there were, you know, sort of certain identities were overwhelmingly referenced um, in offensive ways uh, and underrepresented in positive ways. Um, smart reply again. Um, cool. I'm going to kind of skip through some of these just for the sake of time, but you can look through the slides. There's a lot of examples of this. Um, cool. So, like some solutions. So, again, many of the solutions start at the data level. Um, collecting representative training data is obviously a first step. Um, this is an example of some studies that did this. Um, IBM releasing diverse face data, um, testing models on representative data to try and find breaking points. This kind of like adversarial testing here is really important. Um, algorithmic audits. Um, so this is some work um, where folks were just kind of looking at um, public APIs and doing some really um, thorough and rigorous testing. Um, data set transparency efforts. Um, so this is really important. Um, and I think this, this is an example of something that applies like very, very broadly. I'd love this to sort of catch on more widely. Um, so there's a couple different frameworks for comprehensive data set documentation that have been proposed, um, such as data sheets for data sets, nutrition labels, data statements. Each of these frameworks basically provide a slightly different framework for documenting data set collection and annotation methodologies. Um, and so the overarching goals of these frameworks are twofold. Um, so first, for data set creators, the aim is to provide a process that encourages um, a sort of reflexive um, uh, uh, um, look at, um, you know, the way in which it was created and distributed and maintained, uh, and well as making clear any sort of underlying assumptions that went into the data set creation. Um, and then uh, the, the data set creators are also encouraged to kind of think about harms uh, and implications of use and stuff like that. Um, and then on the data set consumer side, this really facilitates sort of informed decision making. Um, so I think this is something that should just generally be adopted by people who are creating and putting out data sets. 
Um, so basically in summary, if you're working with data, um, you know, collecting data, annotating data, um, using existing data, um, there's a wide range of questions that I think people should always be asking, such as, you know, where did the data come from? Who collected it? Uh, is the data representative? Is there measurement error, reporting bias? Um, if there's annotations, are they subjective? Um, is there, you know, stats on inter-annotator agreement, stuff like that? Um, you know, could the annotations themselves be reflecting harmful social stereotypes? Um, does the data itself reflect patterns um, that would be harmful to reproduce or amplify? Um, Okay, so moving on, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of designing and testing with fairness and inclusion in mind. Um, so, so the first thing we could consider is just looking at multiple different evaluation metrics um, when you're training and evaluating your model. Uh, and this is important because each evaluation metric really provides different types of information about your model. And understanding the implications of different types of errors is, is useful to kind of, you know, help trade off, um, you know, acceptable trade offs between false positives and false negatives and, and so on. Um, so in addition to looking at multiple different error metrics, um, something that you can do is uh, break down your quantitative analysis by different groups of data. Um, so within the ML fairness community, this typically looks like breaking down your data set along um, maybe demographic lines, cultural lines, phenotypical lines. Um, but you could also imagine doing this type of analysis broken down by um, sort of conditions under which the data was um, obtained. Um, different sort of devices, stuff like that, really just trying to understand more fine-grained patterns um, in, uh, in, in, your, in your model's performance. Um, so this is just a good example of some early work that did this. This is a gender shades paper. They adopted this approach. Uh, and the key thing is to kind of look not just at unitary groups, so here are sort of gender-based groups um, and skin tone-based groups, um, but also intersections of those groups. Because um, again, this can kind of tell you more than this kind of aggregated statistics can. Um, so model cards, this is another really nice framework. Um, it's kind of the uh, complementary to the data cards uh, and, and data set um, uh, documentation frameworks that I was just proposing. Um, so the idea here is a formalized set of protocols um, that uh, sort of put forward model evaluations with fairness and inclusion in mind. Um, so actually, before I go on, the goals of this are basically twofold, right? We have the Again, this is very analogous to the, the uh, data set annotations or data set uh, documentation stuff. So for model creators, right, it encourages this kind of like thorough um, and critical evaluations and also like a really thorough consideration of intended uses and stuff like that. And then for the model consumers, again, this is providing um, kind of informed, um, uh, facilitate informed decision making. So basically what this does is we see um, sort of model details broken down um, intended uses broken down or made, made clear, uh, different sort of factors relevant to analysis. Um, so again, this might be, um, you know, breaking down analysis by different devices, different conditions, different subgroups, stuff like that. Um, a, you know, kind of brief summary of what the training data looked like, uh, what the testing data looked like, um, different metrics are going to be proposed. Why are these relevant metrics? Um, what are the trade-offs of the different metrics? Uh, and then the actual kind of quantitative analysis itself is proposed. Um, and then there's additionally an ethical consideration section, um, which I think is also, you know, increasingly important to just kind of put in any kind of model you're developing. Um, and this might be things that, um, you know, were under consideration as the model was being developed, as well as things that people who are going to be using the model should be thinking about. Uh, and then any sort of just additional like caveats and recommendations that the uh, uh, model developers want to convey. So, okay, so now I'm going to get into some things called fairness definitions. Um, so there's been a, a real flurry of work recently on translating uh, complex social notions of fairness into precise mathematical formulations. Um, these are frequently referred to as fairness definitions, and I have fairness in quotes here because I think it's like really important to recognize that these, um, you know, these are mathematical like abstractions and formulations, and they are attempts to capture um, different social notions of fairness, um, but you know, kind of like achieving these different constraints is not going to be sufficient um, for like, you know, a more contextualized and, and nuanced um, understanding of fairness and inclusion in the social sense. Um, so uh, generally speaking, these definitions assume that each data instance is associated with some protected attribute. Um, these attributes will frequently re reflect um, different protected groups in society um, that have often been historically marginalized. Um, and these attributes are, are sort of leveraged in different ways throughout. Um, 
And many of the definitions try and capture something related to a couple different notions of social fairness, um, disparate treatment and disparate impact. Um, disparate treatment is often thought of as like explicit discrimination based on some sensitive attribute, um, whereas disparate impact is, is the sort of more like long-term um, uh, you know, differential outcome. Um, the distinction between these is actually really blurry if you try and like dig deep into structural factors in our society, um, but some of the different fairness definitions are trying to formalize these, so I think it's kind of relevant to bring them up. Um, so um, one thing that people have tried is like fairness through unawareness, and this basically just means um, don't let your predictor have access uh, directly to any of the sensitive attributes like race or gender and so on. Um, this framework has pretty severe limitations, obviously, just because sensitive attributes um, uh, have a lot of proxies. Um, so for example, um, you know, due to the history of segregation in this country, zip code is a really, really good predictor of race. Um, so if you just omit race from your hiring algorithm but include zip code, this is probably not going to be a super fair algorithm. Um, so demographic parity um, is another definition that people have put forward, and this basically asks that the um, rate of positive predictions across different groups, again, these groups might be defined along racial or gendered lines, um, just ask that the, the rate of positive predictions is equal, uh, regardless of that uh, sensitive variable. Um, and so, you know, if we had like a system that was like, I don't know, uh, deciding whether or not to hire people for the job of a CEO, um, then this definition would say you have to hire, um, you know, equal numbers of, of men and women, for example. Um, so equality of odds is a, another condition. Um, so this is basically um, mathematically the same as the last one, except now we're conditioning on um, the true value of the target variable. Um, and so, okay. So yeah, I believe there's an entire talk later this week on interpretability methods. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail, just kind of like speak about a few things basically. Um, but basically, um, you know, neural networks, they're black boxes, they take in inputs, they produce outputs. Um, this is cool, they're really powerful, but it also means that if we're using these systems uh, in ways that are gonna be affecting people in like really significant ways, we need to kind of understand like why are predictions being made. Um, you know, this is important for our, in terms of understanding um, causes of different types of biases, um, but also giving people um, sort of a feeling of control and a mechanism of like, um, you know, coming back and saying, hey, I feel like this decision was unfair or unjust. Um, so uh, TCAB is a really nice method. Um, I believe that the creator of TCAB is coming tomorrow, so I think she'll go into a lot further depth. Um, but I, I really like this method. Basically, it kind of lets you ask the question of like, you know, how important is the concept of gender for this doctor classifier? Um, and it's an interpretability method that works in a kind of high level conceptual space as opposed to um, providing very low level like pixel um, uh, explanations. And so it's, it's quite nice in terms of um, sort of understanding bias of, of classifiers. Um, counterfactual methods are another really nice method. Um, so the idea here is to try and isolate the causal effects um, uh, by asking questions of the form, you know, if one, this one specific thing had changed, all else being equal, how might the prediction be different? Um, and there's a huge sort of history of these types of analyses being done um, outside of the machine learning context. So these are referred to as like audit studies. Um, so people have, you know, looked at bias and hiring decisions, for example, by like sending out uh, equal sets of resumes with names just changed. So you would have like a, you know, stereotypically female name or a male name uh, or names that correlate with different uh, racial groups and then looking at the kind of callback rates um, where everything else in the resume stays the same. So these types of studies have been done previously and people are kind of carrying these, um, these ideas over into testing machine learning models. So I'm just gonna go through a whole bunch of different references here. Basically, um, uh, these types here, they kind of ask uh, if, you know, it, it, most of these are gonna be in the context of images, but this is sort of saying if you, um, if you replace some segment of an image with like a plausible alternative value, um, uh, uh, what region would maximally change the classifier's output? Um, counterfactual fairness models, um, these methods sort of try and perform interventions at the level of sensitive attributes like race or gender, and they're performing the in interventions over a causal graph. Um, these papers are sort of interesting to read if you're interested in machine learning fairness, um, but I would follow them immediately by this, um, with this paper by Issa, um, who talks a lot about how race and gender um, are not really entities that can have counterfactual causality. Um, and this has been kind of looked at in social statistics a lot. There's a huge history of this. Um, it sort of really only makes sense to talk about something having counterfactual causality 
if it is like meaningful to talk about like two units that are identical except for the one thing um, and just the ways in which like race and gender structure every aspect of our society like this this is kind of a nonsensical thing to talk about um, so again interesting papers but I, I think they need to be followed up with like a much more nuanced understanding of of how um, sort of racial and, and gender-based oppression work in our society um, so counterfactual fairness in text um, this is a nice thing basically you know if you flip certain um, tokens in text how does a, a model's prediction change um, and uh, this is another a model that kind of uses generative techniques basically to um, manipulate images and see uh, how the classifier's response changes um, cool so visualizations and other exploratory tools can also answer questions um, and you know um, point to surprising issues in machine learning systems so this is a tool called facets uh, it's an open source visualization tool that i believe came out of google um, and i should know that pretty sure it came out of google uh, and it can it can basically help you understand and analyze um, uh, machine learning data sets um, so go look, look at that um, and then uh, tensorflow model analysis uh, tfma it's another tool um, this provides scalable slice or full pass metrics, uh, lets you look at your model performance broken down by different subgroups, um, and does really sort of nice aggregate um, statistics. Um, so another useful tool. Um, so another important thing to consider is sort of, you know, throughout all of these questions, like who had a say uh, and who was consulted in the design and development process. Um, and, you know, as we've seen machine learning models, they learn from historically collected data sets. Um, and so populations that have, you know, experienced individual or structural biases in the past are often the most vulnerable to harm um, resulting from these models. Uh, and so, you know, it's really important to include, you know, voices of domain experts, but also, um, you know, sort of perspectives of people with lived experiences who can speak to how these systems are going to be used. Um, so um, this is just a nice paper because I've focused a lot on um, kind of vision and NLP applications so far. And so this is sort of looking at machine learning used um, within a clinical setting. Um, and, you know, we see machine learning being increasingly used um, to improve diagnosis and treatment and, and health system efficiency, basically. Um, and this model really looks at how sort of the model design and data collection and all of these things um, <coughs> sorry, could... Uh, um, you know, be done in a really like proactive way to increase health equity. Um, cool. So, so we've looked at data, we've looked at models, um, and just kind of one final plug. I've kind of been saying this throughout, but we really need to understand how these systems are going to be used, and this this requires understanding the broader social context um, within which the systems are being built and deployed. So. Yeah, earlier I talked about some facial analysis systems um, and how a lot of different studies have been done to show that they fail to recognize darker skinned individuals. Um, and so while understanding these kinds of differential um, patterns and performance is important, um, there is a lot of examples of technologies where just equalizing statistics across different groups is not going to be sufficient to solving the problem. Um, so face recognition is an example where the technology is dangerous, um, you know, if it works really well for everybody and it's dangerous if it doesn't work really well for everybody. Um, and so, you know, building, you know, face recognition that works well for everybody is not a technical problem. Um, it's really important to understand how the technology will fit into existing, you know, structures of surveillance and policing and also to understand that um, not all people experience the dangers of surveillance in equal ways. Um, so I'm not, I don't think I have time to go into this, but I, I would recommend reading this article um, from uh, Georgetown Law that looks at, uh, it's like a big analysis of over 100 police departments throughout the country and how they are using, um, end up using face recognition technology. Um, one of the like short anecdotes that comes out of this is basically, um, you know, police officers um, taking a, you know, a, a frame of an image from the CCTV camera and saying, okay, this is, you know, somebody who stole something. I'm going to put it through my face recognition algorithm. Oh, there's no hits, but this guy looks a lot like Woody Harrelson. And so they go off and they Google Woody Harrelson and they pull a photo of Woody Harrelson and they feed that photo into the face recognition system, get a hit from that, and then go investigate that lead. Um, and so obviously this is not the way machine learning models work. Um, this is like, gar this, the title of this article is garbage in, garbage out, right? I mean, they also describe how different law enforcement departments are taking like hand-drawn sketches of faces and feeding those into the algorithm. 
And so like this is, you know, just evidence of like whenever we're building these types of systems, like we, it's not enough to think about like what the intended use case is or what the ideal, you know, scenarios in which it might be used is. Ultimately, if these tools are going to be released to the world, like we need to be thinking about these things like from the beginning. Um, so gender classification, this is another example. Um, like there's, there's no way to like make gender classification like good really like this isn't an issue of like you know minimizing error statistics across different groups um and again some like further reading here um uh sexual orientation classification another thing that like just don't build it um uh this is there's a couple papers that like just won't die um they keep you know resurfacing um some co some colleagues of mine wrote this great medium post um last year um, that just kind of like debunked one of these papers um and yeah read that it's good um and yeah this is a uh, uh a startup that markets itself as being the first to technology and first to market with proprietary computer vision and machine learning technology for profiling people and revealing their personalities based only on their facial image um and it'll it'll predict things like high iq and white collar offender and terrorist just from an image um so again like just think about if you're building something why are you building this like just because you can create a data set with you know inputs and labels and you can train a system to make that prediction doesn't mean that you should be doing it please yeah i know capitalism man i know um so um Pretty, yeah, this is another, this isn't from the same startup, but this is another paper that came out predicting criminality. Um, again, some colleagues of mine, um, they wrote a blog post basically where they, you know, were kind of showing that like, this article is all about like, oh, like the angles between like the nose and the corners of your lips, like that's predictive, but that's also like predictive of frowning and smiling. So like, really, what are you doing here? Um, so yeah if the classification your problem that you're working on is rooted in scientific racism then please don't do it um or rooted in other you know sort of systems of like social classification and oppression um don't do it um so physiognomy is um this kind of pseudoscience that um had a lot of popularity um you know in the turn of the century and you know the idea here is to try and infer like inner characteristics of individuals based solely on their appearance um and this was sort of basically a scientific way of, of justifying racism. Um, and, you know, we're kind of, this was, this was rejected, um, but we're like seeing a recent revival of it with um, machine learning technologies. So just like be aware of the history of the types of problems that you're trying to solve um, and the ultimate impact that it could have. Um, and yeah, this is a, a good blog post. Um, this is a blog post in response to that, like predicting criminality, but it also kind of like goes through a whole history here. So I would recommend reading that as well. Um, and yeah, overall social context is important. Um, so um, a lot of um, machine learning fairness work focuses very specifically on kind of like equalizing error statistics across different groups. Uh, and this is like a really important part um, of understanding um, how technologies are working and a really important thing to consider when you're you know building and designing machine learning technologies um, but kind of assessing fairness purely at an algorithmic level um, is insufficient um, ultimately you know we need to be understanding how are these systems going to be used um, what are the social structures that they're going to slot into um, and uh, and really thinking about that sort of fully contextualized understanding when we're trying to build fair and equitable um, just inclusive machine learning models. Um, and yeah, so I kind of like initially phrased this like this, right? You had your data, you had your model, uh, and you might think about intended uses and hopefully you're documenting all of this and hopefully you're, you know, doing um, really rigorous testing throughout the whole thing. Um, but ultimately I think that like all of these questions about social impact and potential for abuse um, should be asked like right from the get-go. Um, you know, design, data collection, model development, testing, deployment, like all of these things like really need to be reframed within a critical understanding of the different social structures um, that influence data generation and collection. Um, and then also how this technology is gonna be used. Um, and none of this can kind of come after the model is trained. Um, so yeah, there we go, finished just in time, cool.